Welcome to Graphic Policy Radio, where comics and geek culture meet. This is the show for fans who know that Samuel Tarley was right and that Jan Royce is basically the U.S. Senate. Yes, Mitch McConnell laughs at us and thinks we're animals for now. He'll find out. This is your host, Elon Levin, and we are covering the Game of Thrones finale. Now, uh, from here on out is all spoilers, because good God, why would you be listening to this if you hadn't been watching the show? Uh, which brings me to something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, there's a viral joke that the real Game of Thrones was the friends we made along the way. And while that's been joked about a lot by fans, not just of this show, but of all kinds of things, like I think Avengers maybe got joked about it. Um, I mean, you think that actually a lot of Game of Thrones fans, we, we did make friends along the way. Stephen, I met you through your writing about Game of Thrones, and now you're one of my best friends. Indeed. And that's how, that's, that's how we, that's, we met along the way. And, and Tihi, you found your like Dothraki community, and you, you got a new name out of this. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's very strange to think that the show is finally over now and how much it actually changed my life. And Sarah, you've known me since freshman year. Yes, we've all, we've been friends much longer. We've seen many kingdoms rise and fall. Yeah, I got no segue for us, but it's good to have you back on the show, Sarah Rasher. Thank you. <laughs> and happy birthday. Thank you. Um, so, since the series has brought so many people together, it really saddens me that right now people begin taking this like, well, what did you expect attitude towards each other when they disagree about the results of the show? Like when some person, so you half the tweets are somebody saying, oh, so you thought this was a fairy tale, ha ha. The other half are people saying, oh, you thought the white savior was gonna, wasn't going to be evil. Like everybody has their own sarcastic line on how anybody who didn't have their own interpretation of the text was an idiot. I just want people to stop being dicks to each other and to focus on being dicks to Mitch McConnell. Um, exactly. <laughs> and I know that, right? I know that today's assembled panel, we're not going to all agree on everything, and that's fine, and we're not going to be dicks. And we're also not going to share a million inside jokes as we don't all know each other. And I suppose this podcast might not be all about the friendships we built all along the way. Um, so what is bringing us together isn't just thinking that dragons look cool, which they do. It's an interest in digging deep into the themes and political significance of the series. Now, Stephen and I are book readers. In fact, Stephen has written two books about the books. Uh... Sarah has watched the show and is bringing their perspective as a former professor of Shakespeareology along. And Tihi Hazlett uh, has begun reading the books and speaks Dothraki. Uh, these are the perspectives for which we bring to bear on the show. And I will start uh, by asking a question on the minds of many a people. What the fuck was up with the bells? The bells, the caroling of the bells. I, you know, had you asked me prior to the second to the last episode if I had specific feelings about how I needed things to end, I would have told you that I really don't, and I still don't. But I was found myself very frustrated that the great atrocity war crime wasn't committed as part of the fog of war. Like, I really was expecting, I, I felt like it was going to be, like, they are going to try to ring the bells and they wouldn't be able to for some reason. So she sort of bogs things in the fog of war. And it's completely, it, it's still a complete atrocity. There's still no freaking excuse. But there's this narrative in her head in which she thinks that she did what she had to do and that the great tragedy, perhaps the great Shakespearean tragedy even, would be that um, her impatience or her lack of trust of the other people in her team to achieve their jobs or her lack of belief that the people of King's Landing might do the thing they need to do made her assume that she had to just fucking throw up her hands and bomb everything, for which there's really no excuse at any point. So that's how I thought it was going to happen, an atrocity committed in confusion, born out of poor judgment, lack of faith, impatience and self-centeredness but what we got was both darker and more simplistic well steven you have a particular counter theory about the way the ending plays out do you want to hit us with that a little bit sure so uh i have this running theory that i've written about in a couple places uh probably most uh thoroughly in, in an essay that's on my uh wordpress site called the king's landing endgame book versus show in which I basically argue that I think the a lot of the events of episodes 4, 5, and 6 in the books happen before the events of episode 3. That the King's Landing storyline is resolved, and then our characters move north to deal with uh, the Army of the Dead, because, you know, George R. R. Martin titled his books A Song of Ice and Fire, 
not a Game of Thrones. And I think there's a, you know, we have many quotes from him about the sort of the nature of the White Walkers and what their threat is supposed to represent uh, that I don't think the showrunners quite grokked. Um, so, yeah, that, I you know, it's, it's not necessarily that I think everything is going to be completely different. I think many of the, like, factual questions, you know, this happens, then this happens, will be roughly the same. But, the to me, the changing of the ordering has enormous impact on the sort of, um, the, the context and meaning of various actions. Um, you know, I, I, from, from the finale episode, you know, I think if, you know, John kills Danny, given that Martin's done this whole set up stuff about Nissa Nissa and, you know, sacrifice being necessary to save the world you know, that is, I think, a real dilemma that a character could face. That's his, you know, Martin's whole idea about a human heart at war with itself, as opposed to coming, you know, not out of nowhere, but very quickly. And I think that's one of the things, like, even the people who who liked the last season, uh, you know, I've been reading all of the commentary, have noted that it felt very fast. Did feel really fast um and so this is interesting so i've been going back thinking about the bells i've re-watched the scene where daenerys hears the bells and she's on the dragons and i, I think amelia clark was amazing in her acting ability in that moment because it to me my read of it was like so much personal emotion and like understanding that like this ending was a false ending. Like they did all this work to get to King's Landing and now it's just going to be a surrender. Like she's not actually going to confront Cersei and like all of, you know, her friend Masande was killed and like she struggled her whole life. And it was like all of that life story came up on her face and she just made that decision that like, no, she, this this conflict is going to end on her terms, not on her uh, opponent's terms. And I kind of respect that. And I feel like this might be a controversial opinion, but I was 100% in favor of burning King's Landing down to the ground. Um, <laughs> yes. Okay. That, weird right. flex, but... Yeah, it was a weird one. Here. I was like, man, I feel a certain way about innocent people dying, but also... Burn it all down to the ground. Because uh, in, in my head, for me, it's like the whole system of Westeros is like garbage. And like Cersei is like a tyrant. You know, da Daenerys is also a tyrant. I'll give people that too. But like there, yes. there is not going to be any equitable system that's ever going to happen in Westeros, right? It's pretty much like this stand-in for European medieval history where it was all effed up anyway unless you were somebody of nobility. So I was like, well, fuck it. Kill them all then. Burn the whole city down. Also, Masande was dead, and she was one of my favorite people. So, like, really quickly after she died, I lost, like, so much vested interest in the show. And I was like, I, I literally don't care anymore. And any of the characters can do whatever. Like, anybody can die. I was like, everyone can catch these hands because I'm pissed at every character. Uh, except for Masande, but she's dead now. So I was like, burn the whole thing. Just, yeah, yeah cleanse it with cleanse fire. fire. <laughs> so basically you're Daenerys, and therefore you feel your actions were completely justified. Yes. Which now makes sense to me. <laughs> um, yeah, and, I, and what Stephen mentioned about it being short, and me as, like, someone who I have seen every episode more or less on time, and so I'm not incredibly passionate about the show but i do like it and have a lot in, invested and really wanted to see it through and see the conclusion my reaction throughout the season was just like i wish they'd had the time and the budget to just give it two more hours mm. and that that i feel like things like daenerys's heel turn or justified rampage depending on your version of events um, <laughs> would have made a lot more sense and I have promised Ilana that we won't get to this quite yet, but there are certain characters who did survive who I felt like we had been led to believe that there would be a conclusion to their narrative. And if there had been another hour or two, there would have been a conclusion to their narrative. Mm -hmm. And, you know, spoiler alert, pretty much all of them are either women or people of color. Huh. Yeah. So, gee, <laughs> shocking. 
So yeah, I mean, my 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 my, first, my feeling with respect to the the firebombing of King's Landing sort of fits into generally like that. Um, if I, I mean, Stephen and I were both sort of shouting this back and forth at each other. Like, <laughs> it sort of argues it argues that if you are someone who's going to blow up the blow up this you know you're going to burn down the slavers and then you're going to burn down the other slavers and then what's next you're just going to burn down the people who are a little bit fucked up but are not actually the slavers and i'm like no actually you you can like join world war ii and not join the vietnam war it's completely an option to not have wars over bullshit and to have wars that save lives like you you don't have to be an absolutist in these matters and like i really felt like when when fucking when, when when Tyrion goes and pulls a Neomolar yeah. on John, and he's like, first they came, you know, Neomolar meaning like the first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Mm-hmm. Then they they came for the trade unionists, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unit unionist. And then you know, and then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out. Like Tyrion basically sets up that particular escalation of, and then they came for, but like rooted in the uh, slavers of Marine, and I'm like. No, I, I fully believe that we're capable of seeing the difference between slavers and people who aren't slavers and deciding that it's okay to burn slavers and deciding that we're not going to burn people who aren't. Yeah, yeah and also in, in the same like context of like Daenerys holds a Nuremberg rally with an audience entirely of brown people and, you know, the, the evil that she's presenting is worldwide liberation of oppressed peoples. I'm like, oh, I'm I'm really not on board with any of this. Like, you know, the the show, you know, in terms of its like internal political sensibilities, you know, has for a while had something of like a uh I think you could argue like an anti revolutionary sensibility. I mean, we saw this especially in the way that the Marine storyline ended up, but like this is really pushing it beyond the bounds of what's reasonable. It was a little weird. I also I had a lot of thoughts too around the complicity of the citizenry of King's Landing because like we don't really get to see a lot in the show about how certain people govern. Like what is the governing difference between Joffrey and Cersei? But we can assume that Cersei's terrible, right? And that she's like a bad ruler. But none of these people decided to change their political system to rise up and like ouster out and like instead they kind of just like went about their lives because like either a it didn't really matter or b they weren't necessarily hurting that bad under cersei not bad enough to want political change so to an extent i was like daenerys can't really rule without burning king's landing down to the ground like she had to flush the whole system out um which makes me sad i know i feel like i sound crazy but i even like sometimes feel that about dc like (laughs) fuck all of congress like they're all eat like it's like let's just get rid of them all and start over i can't believe you're going full tanky on us i was not expecting this i did uh, not expect that i would end up at this place either I, I, (laughs) i do think that that ties with the whole foreshortening thing which is you know one of the things that we saw in you know at the end of season six is after you know after this, like, charismatic religious revolution in the capital, Cersei blew up the Pope mm-hmm. and, m- you know, the, most of the ruling family of the Reach, and there was no reaction from the populace of King's Landing. Exactly. In, sh- in-, in essence, because they, like, you know, this this has been my thing about the show lacking object permanence. It's like, <laughs> the moment they weren't on screen, they ceased to exist. Like, this political force that had almost wiped out Joffrey back way back in Season 2, that, like, brought the High Sparrow to power in Season 5, in Season 6, like, these were people with a political voice and a political mind. And the fact that they sort of ceased to become anything that had to be taken account of you know, seemingly just because, you know, the showrunners wanted to, like, you know, narrow things down into just a few characters and just a few plot lines, I think did a real damage to the... Uh, how did that line go in that article? The sociological um, underpinnings of the show? Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's an amazing piece by Zeynep Tefeki over at... Um, I think I pronounced her name properly. Uh, at Scientific American 
that um, are, I think it was a really unique piece that argues that the, the frustration that a lot of us feel who like who loved the books uh, and who have questions with the show is that the the books were really rooted in a sociological analysis of society and the the show particularly after the end of George R. R. Martin's material was really focused on uh, personal individual people's feelings and psychological motivations and that that is more generic also, and less interestingly political i feel like after the show outpaced the books to this really became a narrative of like white mediocrity white male dominance like to me watching this whole season and even see, seeing the finale it was not necessarily surprising because i've just sort of seen the white privilege in the storytelling itself and i'm like i don't trust these showrunners to handle any of the characters I care about with any sort of care anymore um, because they're like doing this whole Jon Snow is like the Targaryen and he's going to sit on the throne even though he doesn't want it and then it ends up going to Bran who like you know that was kind of left field but I was like man they'll just find any way for white men to succeed in Europe and I guess like all of us Dothraki are like you know the afterthought. Which my other thing too that I noticed this season with the Dothraki. Oh yeah, where did they go? They got lighter and lighter skinned every episode they were in. By the end of this season, like the very last season, they show the Dothraki on the docks, which I think is a hint that they're going back to Essos. But they oh, were the did most they go with pale. The Unsullied? Okay. Maybe they did go with the Unsullied, but I okay, doubt it. I'm like generally un- I don't think they went with the Unsullied. One of the critics uh, has argued that we see an integrated cosmopolitan Dothraki population in King's Landing. I did what? not catch that with my own um, viewing of it, but I have not gone back to re to reread it. I mean, I think if if the Dothraki are like, fuck, we live in the city now, we're like gonna have Dothraki That's town, a, and like that would be. I'm that curious, is a long ass stretch. Wild. That was yeah. not what it, no. That is a reach. That is a long ass reach. <laughs> but the Dothraki do have a city. They have Vias Dothrak that is arguably, according to like the the mythos, like more cosmopolitan than King's Landing, even because there's more different cultures there and everything. So I think like, but at the same time, most of the Dothraki who are with Daenerys didn't spend a lot of time in Vias Dothrak. They were all part of the Kalisar culture that roamed, that were you know pretty much rural, like you know. Not hunter gatherers, but more like uh, pastoralists, you know, and they have like a, a wide stretch of land, which makes me think like, no, they wouldn't go to Noth because it's too small. Um, but maybe they could stay in King's Landing. But I'm also 100 percent sure that everyone in Westeros is racist and that they're not going to thrive there that well um, or that they're going to find the piece of land that they like in Westeros that reminds them of the great Dothraki sea, and then they're just going to take it over. Well, it's one of the challenges with the books because in, you know, in the books you have this real sense of there being a lot of racially diverse people living in King's Landing when we kick off. Like there's a guy, there's an African prince who like everybody knows, and he's just sort of like a colorful, like local character and people talk and it's just like, like you see these, like none of these None of these characters are like major characters with their own culture and agenda in any significant way, and that's really frustrating. But like the story, the book itself is very aware that they live there. Yeah, the, and, the Summer Islands just as, never showed up on the show. At yeah, all. exactly. And they're and, they're yeah. arguably the most like advanced civilization in. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you just don't see them on the show. So it's sort of like in George's world, and also like the 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 uh, the, the, the the Dornish folks are not white yeah not fucking white uh and the show after after oberon dies just as like and after they make i don't even want to call those the sand snakes because they were not like uh i you know just as like we don't they don't really matter they don't care and so like in in one reality there you know there would be this like multicultural you know still white dominant and white people still make racial stereotype it's basically would be like America now, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> like white people are running shit and being awful, but it's not like you can't fucking live. Like, well, I mean, if you're, it depends where. Yeah. I don't know. yeah. One thing but you know what I'm really... saying? Like there was there there was space there's space in that one for people to live, even though there's also like fucked up dynamics, yeah. which is sort of which really and it you know and speaking from a historical like our world perspective, like the number of times I have been in rooms with academics who specialize in in the Renaissance, which is what I specialized in back when I was an academic. Um, 
the more like the number of times I had to explain no, like people then would have seen people of color. People back then would have seen a Jewish person and a Muslim if they lived in a major city. Yeah. They would have not only like we have lots of textual records that they would have known queer people and known trans people and known intersex people and there were words for it so this whole idea of either we're being daring by acknowledging things existed in the case of a lot of the queerness although none of that was at all present in the final season thing yeah um and we will get also to the like ableist issues with it with where Tyrion ended up to um Mm -hmm. that a lot of the protestations of the level of visibility are not really understanding how the world worked and the level of cosmopolitan um, integration in in major cities in the Middle Ages and Renaissance. Yeah. Also, like, one other point that, like, jumped out at me in the final episode, speaking of Dorne, was that, so Sansa gets to totally annex the North from yeah. Westeros, but Dorn, like the Dorn guy, is just sitting there, says nothing. I was like, really, really, like Dorn has a long separatist history from the Seven Realms, and like this dude, who's like probably the last surviving Martell because everyone has died at this point, and he, he like, you know, I feel like the showrunners just at a certain point to wrap up the story kind of abandoned the mythology of the story. Because it really didn't make any sense. They're like, okay, the North can go, but like, Dorn, you stay. And he's like, I mean, all right, my, cool. My, my headcanon, of course, is that he's learned from the wisdom of Doran Martell and is like definitely planning their secession. He just isn't going to announce it at a meeting. Does the show know that that's what's happening? I don't think so, <laughs> yeah. but that's certainly what, what I know that's happening. He's like, yeah, okay, bye. And the thing is, like, Bran, and this is another one of my political frustrations. I mean, Bran is a super checked out leader. Right. Like that. They basically tell us that's why he's good. And I I wonder if, you know, you could certainly say, like, maybe what happens after this is is ultimately a dissolution of the central monarchy. Uh, And certainly with all these freaking people being slaughtered at King's Landing, you know, I, I, I did not first notice this. I wish someone could remind me who did. Like this is a similar condition to what happened after the end of the Black Plague, where you had not enough, quote, peasants, quote, to do the work. And so the underclass actually was able to build more political power. So maybe this is a maybe this is dissolving some of that really bad social order in so some ways. There was a really interesting uh, post by a political scientist, Stephen Siderman, uh, called Secession in Westeros, It Ain't Over. And was basically making an analogy to, uh, like, what happened to Yugoslavia. And was saying, like, yeah, like, Dorne's gonna go, the Iron Islands are gonna go, um, you know, he'll probably keep most of the rest, because it's a little bit more uh, integrated and has less of an, in, you know, history and culture of independence. But, like, that's not gonna be great for the central monarchy. It's gonna be like, things are going to get more difficult because, you know, we know that, like, Dornish-Westerosi relations, when Dorn is independent, tend to be somewhat violent. We know that the Iron Islands, when they're independent, you know, like to raid everywhere else. Mm-hmm. You know, and so on and so forth. So, the you know, the thing that kind of drove me crazy at in the finale, politically speaking, wasn't so much the idea of an elective monarchy, because those existed. It's the idea that an elective monarchy ends political conflict. <laughs> right. It only ends political conflict if you don't believe in the agency of people, like, as individuals at all, right? And I, I feel like with the books, it could, you know, you have the time to get into, like, these sort of complexities and play out different kinds of storylines. But I do feel like a lot of my frustration on how the show ended should be rightly placed at the hands of the showrunners, D and D who made like a lot of these strategic choices that were, um, you know, that like sort of gloss over that fact. Like they don't really hint at like the future of the, the political world of Westeros anymore or Essos. Like, you know, because we, we talked about this the last time we had a Game of Thrones thing. Like, the Dothraki leaving Essos creates a whole political power vacuum yeah. over there. Um, and Daenerys not being over there also creates a whole other political power vacuum. Um, which made, like, you know, her final monologue when she was like, oh, we're going to go to all the lands, liberate all the people. 
And I was like, ooh, like, it's it's a really, like, I was like, I thought Daenerys was smarter than that. And it's like, how long have you been in Westeros now? You don't even know what's going on in your own cities that you already conquered and took over. Right. Like, and you right. don't seem to want to go back to check in on them. Yet you think you can continue this wave of liberation, which is a very, like, you know, white savior liberation. Um which it, it just flat out is. But, like, the fact that, like, she never really thought about governing um, or that she always said that she would wait for governing for, like, you know, Westeros or try to govern in Slaver's base so that she can learn to govern in Westeros. Uh, and so that felt like a really, like, weird right turn for me on Daenerys as a Dothraki person who was just going to follow her regardless. Like, I was fine with killing King's Landing, but, like... <laughs> global liberation just struck me as like what girl like you're you didn't think this through and then she well, I mean, died like three seconds later there's like two things i just want to point with with this one being like i did give the show credit for having her repeat the speech that she and um wow i'm forgetting the name of her husband cal drogo cal drogo we're giving where she said i told you we would go to the snowman houses and knock them over and i told you we would like you know, but she has this litany of the threats that they gave to the people, uh, to the knighthood, basically, of uh, Westeros and Shed. Like, and we lived up to all those things. And so the question is, you know, were we just not listening to the propaganda that she was using and assuming it was just big words and thinking that that was, she was speaking to the Dothraki and the language that she needed to speak to, but that she didn't really actually mean those things. And she actually did mean those things. And then it's, it's like fucked up that we assumed that she had to talk about that, those things, those ways to be heard by the people if, um, if it, and, and not to take her at her word. Uh, and I guess this brings to the, the question, which, uh, you know, we haven't asked on this show and has been asked elsewhere, but I just, I, I can't help but think about it. It's like, so was Danny George W. Bush all along? <laughs> ah. I don't think so. No, but I don't I think she kind I'm of gonna need some time to actually come up with some some definitive I mean, I arguments. I think that's what Benioff and Weiss were probably going for. I mean, certainly the way that they hit liberation so hard. Yeah. Um you know, we discussed this offline. I don't think the timing quite works out for George R. R. Martin to have been thinking that because you know, his pitch letter was in, like, 1993, Storm of Swords, which is where the whole slave crusade happens, so if it was going to come up anywhere, it would have come up there, was, like, published in 2000 and written in 98, 99. So, you know, I think this is, like, you know, as with the, the Nymuller thing and as with that one uh, um, shirtless burn victim, which <laughs> seemed to be like evoking both, you know, Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, and, you know, Vietnam napalm bombing. I think this is a case of like two showrunners who are, uh, to be polite. I don't think the, the like deepest of people, exactly. uh, searching for, for like touchstones that they know are universally seen as deep. Yeah. I saw it as like two white men, white men their way through the end of the show <laughs> and all the things like once, once the Night King battle in Winterfell happened and like we thought the Dothraki were decimated, I was like, of course, because this is what like white privilege can do to storytelling is you just completely create, you know, relegate all of your of color characters, all your women characters to being entirely supporting. But their problem was they had three really strong women characters after the battle. So they have Daenerys, they have Sansa, they have Cersei. Um, yeah. But after that battle, after seeing like how they were treating, I was like, they're just going to white men this whole thing. I came into the final episode like already angry because I was like, I know they're going to make Jon Snow king, even though he doesn't want it. I know they're going to kill Daenerys. Um, and like, I just have to get fine with that. But then like, even with those already low expectations, like D and D, the showrunners found even lower places to go <laughs> with like, um, we'll I'm, have okay, brand I'm, going, I'm going to raise you to five strong women because we are, because Arya and Brienne were still there. Yeah. True. Um, regardless of what in particular they tried to do to Brienne. And I am going to be your chief feminist correspondent for the next couple of minutes here. And also <laughs> note that if Alana and I start giggling uncontrollably, it's because our fifth host is her cat who yeah. is really enthusiastic about 
joining in. I've never seen Dinosaur express so many opinions about television before. Anyway, she actually <laughs> really had a lot of feelings about the finale, too. But my whole thing, when we were sort of preparing for this podcast, I was like, at some point, you're just going to have to let me go off about, about Sansa and Brienne. And one of the things that our conversation about um, about the sort of a, like the sort of passive governance was just going to split off some of the um, some of the kingdoms in the end. Sansa waits about thirty seconds before she says, "You know, you can make whoever you want king of the other six kingdoms, but the North is independent." Yes. This king and, I just voted for. Uh, yeah, yeah, the king that I just voted for, I voted for him so I could get out. My brother. I'm not going to be ruled by my little brother. Um, but also, like, it was sort of her way... It was a way to give her power, sort of... As, as the show portrayed it, it was a sort of notional transfer of power to her. But the fact that she wasn't even visible for the first two-thirds of that episode <laughs> and has been largely invisible for most of this season... Um, and... It's like, it's great that she's Queen of the North now, and it's kind of where I, she's my favorite, and it's kind of where I wanted her to end up, sure. but there was no narrative progression to make that feel earned and interesting. It was sort of like, you, you are the runner-up on this game of Survivor, and we will give you the $50,000 <laughs> in a shitty kingdom in the North. Um, and I would have been really cool with it if it had been as a result of the show developing the fact that she is probably the most competent politician in the Seven Kingdoms at this point, and probably of anybody, the one person who could be running the show, except that for reasons that are not clear, nobody even really fucking thinks of her. Um, exactly. And it's just... Um, it was just to me a sort of like you ha you have made this obvious setup for the entire run of the show of the development of this character of this sort of flighty and shallow teenage girl to this like stone cold iron hearted raging badass and you give her a consolation prize and meanwhile Brienne is stuck with the most garbage cabinet position it's not like she's gonna get anything done um and her main emotional arc is suddenly having sort of school schoolgirl romantic fe feels for you know jamie draco and leather pants lannister which we really didn't need. And I'm not only saying this because I am the only Brienne and Sa Sansa shipper. You're not the only one. I'm not yeah. the only one. Um, An archive but, of our own strongly but, but disagrees because with you. I, it was just like, yeah, that's how you take a warrior, a, a warrior woman and cut her down to size is you give her a totally unsuitable boyfriend that makes her do things that she would not... Or, otherwise do and I just felt like and okay she's going to run the government now except nobody's going to listen to her no and I think that um, what we've been saying about white privilege what really stood out to me was that male privilege in having built up and built up and built up these um, strong female characters and I felt like Arya's narrative got a satisfying resolution, at least somewhat, but they were just like, oh, we built up these great characters, and now we have to squeeze them into some tropes because we don't know what else to do. I mean, I don't think, I think that Arya got a happy ending in the sense that she's not tied down to obligations she doesn't want to have, and I even look at her hair in that last scene where she's no longer wearing the Ned Stark hair. She now has her hair up in its own distinct style as being symbolic of her transforming to be fully her own person rather than just sort of following her father's footsteps, but it is a completely left field. Like, she's never shown any indication exactly. of an explorer, and plus, like, what's going to happen is she's she going to go, quote, discover, quote, a new place, and then, like, Export Westerosi forms of oppression and colonialism. There, like, I don't think, I don't think she'd want to do that. But I think that's what would happen. Or, you know? 
She's got a boat full of smallpox blankets. She's got, exactly, yeah. exactly. Again, like, I don't think she wants to, but that's what's going to yeah. happen. And, like, my thought was, like, she's, like, all of her skills, right? She has all these rogue assassin skills. So what is she going to do when she finds another civilization? Like, really, all she knows how to do is kill people. Like- and I was just, yeah, and, you know, it's interesting because, like, we, you, you, we, she only gets to, she only skin, uh, face changes, like, once in this whole show. I really thought they were going to use that ability of hers at some point yes. in this episode, maybe in, in, in some way, um, that, you know, since they've shown her building such a unique skill. And so on the one hand, I, I think she gets a happy ending, but it's also a very left field one, which feels like they just didn't put a whole lot of time into thinking about what would actually make sense. Yeah. They didn't. And Object I feel like... Permanence. Object permanence. Yeah, no, I yeah. think, Stephen, you're totally on to something with this. One thing I also want to think point to that I think shows... The way in which the show in many ways cheats like the book experience was, you know, if you've read if you've read the books, then you know that Brienne writing that Sir Jamie information in the um, in the white book of the Kingsguard is a sign that she's become the head of the Kingsguard and that yeah. doing that is what you do as the head of the Kingsguard. Um, and it, it's also sort of her, you know, being an author of history and saying, no, the story happened the way I said it happened and sharing the truth that she knows. But if you don't know that context from the books, then you think that the last thing Brienne does is like write about a boy who broke her heart, which is not actually what's happening in that scene. But why would you know that from the show? In the, if you're just watching the show, then that is what you think. So if you're watching the show, you're like, wow, that was really fucking sexist. And if you've read the book, you're like, oh, that's really cool. Yeah, un- we unless shouldn't you have pay this really close split- attention to like the armor she's wearing right. and what she's doing in the, in the small council room. They it, also reference that book. That. In previous seasons, too, about Jamie Lannister's entry and how it's not finished yet, but it has like the Kingslayer and stuff like that. I feel like having not gotten very far in the books yet, like I got, I, I noticed all of that um, context of her sitting down there. Like she's the head of the Night's Guard. It was nice that she was like getting to dictate history, but it still really sucked that it was about Jamie Lannister. And like, but I thought the actress did amazing with oh, the God. material she had. Amazing. Actually, let's talk about the Night's Watch real quick. So John gets sent to the Night's Watch, which in one sense, I'm like, yes, this has a good parallel. And I think he'll do good things there because he's... But like, why is there a Night's Watch exactly. if oh there are no more... If there's no more uh, ice zombies coming to kill you? And that makes you think about the question of like, so basically there's a guard. There's the, oh, it's to guard the realms of men. Uh, you know, one of the things I loved from the books is it points out through John that they're, they're not... The, the Night's Watch acts like it's guarding the realms of men, meaning the realms of people who live south of the wall, but it's supposed to be about guarding all humans from the ice zombies. And sort of they draw that distinction, and it's this really important theme there. In the show now, we, we have no more, we think, ice zombies. We only have humans. So do they, is, is the continued permanence of the Night's Watch meaning that we're going to still regard the free folk as others? Do we need to have a permanent other separated from us from a wall? Uh, John certainly is like seen through in the end of this transcending that he's going with the wildlings, with his BFF and his doggy. Uh, it's on the other side of the wall to like find new ground. And you see the, the, the single green shoot, which I want to yes. think about. But like, it, I just wasn't sure, like, is it does, is the fact that the Night Watch, the, what is the significance of the persistence of the Night's Watch? Let's pretend that this isn't just an object permanent permanence yeah. question. So this was something really interesting because uh, the pre-season you know, season leaks, uh, which were largely on point about what happened, uh, predicted something that turned out not to, to happen, which is that, you know, when John went back to the Night's Watch that he would go north of the wall and he would see another White Walker spiral suggesting, like, it's not over, dun-dun-dun. And, like, in that case, yeah, you know, the idea, you know, and and certainly I think this is going to happen in the books, which is you're going to have a Night's Watch that's, like, rededicated itself to the purpose, to its original purpose of protecting all of humanity from, you know, the true existential threat. Uh, But, like, there's no indication in the show... That, you know, I mean, especially once you have this whole idea of the Night's King, you know, and he's dead, so they're all dead forever and ever and ever, you know, that sort of outlet is lost, and therefore the Night's Watch, like, now they're just Border Patrol. Basically. And that, like, not only not only is the Night King and all of his people gone, but the Free Folk have been, like, demysticized, even, because they've come down south 
They've lived with the Northmen. They fought with the Northmen, mm. right? And it's like you don't really need a wall between them anymore. Like the structure is still there, but it's got a big ass hole in it. Um, well, that that's the other thing is that like the fact that you know John like died trying to settle the the wildlings on the gift, right? A, yet another act of like a non Westerosi people trying to be integrated into Westerosi society. And now, like, the final thing in their story is like, well, no, fuck that, we're going back so that you can have your nice Heron Volk, uh, you know, electoral monarchy. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah, and it's true, like, that is one of the examples we had of, you know, when Sam brings up the, dem- the democracy as an idea, he's drawing on the fact that the Night's Watch has been voting for their Lord Commander, and the Free Folk had elected to follow someone for the first time collectively. Like, it's, and there's, the, you know, in the books, there's the Queen's Moot slash King's Moot amongst... Like, there are some models of democracy that people could reflect upon and include. And, you know, it just, it's, it's so schizophrenic to me how... Um, it's, so divi- it's so divided to me how... On the one hand, it's like, yeah, no, the, the, all of these uh, rulers from the various lords are going to laugh at the notion of democracy. And are we expected to say, it's propo- yes, this, of course, like they're never going to consider this as an option. Are we going to say, like, actually, that's a real tragedy because there are precedences for how this could have been introduced in the end. And is the lack of going in that direction a lack of imagination? Because, you know, you've all these people who are trying to be more cynical than thou. And the more cynical than thou people are saying, well, of course... It ended with the continuation of the monarchy. What were you expecting? You thought this would share your values? Meanwhile, it's like, well, if you actually are trying to truly subvert fantasy story narratives, they're not being a king and uh, the fa- is, is one way to do that. And it's not like he's making this shit up from out of nowhere. There are precedences in this story of, being, of there being mm-hmm. democratic bodies. And it's and um, I think and the the phrase democratic bodies because I keep thinking back on the people who are left in that sort of depowered regime um, are people with un, it's almost all people with unconventional bodies. You've got mm. um, you you've got a young man who with paralysis. Mm. You've got a, you've got a dwarf. And you've got um, Sam, who who's weight, and who who like he he has a fatness that takes up space is kind of the fat theory that goes with that, mm-hmm. and that they're all the people who are sort of visually non-standard, and that we as viewers.
and for and, and that the show didn't really know what to do with that and really yeah. underserved it. Mm-hmm. And and seemed to substitute just sort of like have a very vacant look on your face. Don't put your contacts in. Uh, that was literally the direction he got was don't put your contacts in. Be oh. the stoner. Um, I, mean, I and, loved and, all and those memes. So what like do you think about the whole soliloquy? T- sorry, Tyrion's whole soliloquy at the at the at the final decision of who shall be king of of, of the rubble um, was you know talks about the power of stories and I and, and uses that to to support Bran and it's like this is the most clearly like written by a writer like yeah. Yeah. argument that you could make <laughs> and it's interesting because it's like Bran's story could have been one of the best stories if it had been told with a sort of amount of interiority that it was lended in the books that this show was never going to know how to do but if you're basing this on the show then no he doesn't have the best story that's Sansa like why how how and 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 of course you can also say well they'd never give it to her anyway but then make that explicit have them laugh at that the way they laughed at giving the giving the small folk the vote it was it was definitely writery, but like yeah, in my head too, it was just it was very like white male. Like it was like Tyrion soliloquy is the producers telling us like we've picked the king for you. Um, yes, and it's not really like a real conversation of like like who has power, who has like built relationships and stuff like that. Because of course it's not Bran, and it could be like Sansa would be the the natural pick. Or literally anyone else but Bran. <laughs> like... Yeah, I think I think a really good uh, uh, comparison that I saw was like that uh, Tyrion speech was like where the show very briefly became the West Wing, because <laughs> in in the political universe that like Game of Thrones has operated in for for seven seasons, like an inspirational speech does not win the day. It you know there are real you know real politic decisions. Uh, you know, and the fact that, like, all of a sudden, the destiny of all, you know, well, six or four of the seven kingdoms uh, is suddenly decided by, like, Tyrion giving a real good speech, and then literally, that that was the other thing. Not just that, like, okay, he wins the vote, but it's unanimous. That, like, uh. there's not even much of a, you know, besides Edmure taking one last kick in the ass for for the camera like there's there's not much controversy like we we don't hear from asha saying like you know fuck this i don't want to real be ruled by a stark we don't hear a dornish person saying like we bent the knee to the targaryens not to you like there's none of that real politics yeah. instead it's it's the politics of stories and you know i what i've loved about the books always was the complexity of the of of the capital p politics of the book like and we've really been missing that we've really well, been missing that and yeah we we definitely have and i feel like too like i don't know i i, I feel like i'm just always going to come off like bashing uh the the showrunners but because I am, because, like, I don't like them as people having watched this whole experience and, like, lived in it. And, like, I'm not tuning in for their Star Wars or whatever. But, like, to me, it's just, like, it's their decisions. Like, this show was really good at, not always perfect, but really good at the political complexity. And as soon as they outpaced their source material, Tyrion got real stupid um, in terms of, like, his advice and how he was acting. Uh, a lot of the secondary characters, especially the women and people of color, got totally relegated. Like, all of these things that feel inauthentic, I think we can trace back to those two white men, white menning the shit out of what would have been a really good and complex story. Mic drop. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, sorry, I, I, I agree. Uh, and so, I, uh, so one, of the, one of the other, you know, creative pieces of this, like, question of like winter and the climate change piece yes so we see the green shoot like one of the moments in the finale that i was like i'm so glad this was included there's a few of those that was one of the few of them um like are we to believe that uh because we've defeated the white walkers that this they're going to go back to having normal seasons um is if if this is the case then you're actually going to be able to produce more food and sustain the population better Mm -hmm. um it, you know, is there any possibility of the White Walkers returning to sort of recounterbalance the environment, kind of like Dune, you know, with like the sandworms and like I, 
I don't know if we. I don't know that they've thought about it, but I kind of want to. Well, it's um, when. Sorry, hold on, hold on to you. Yeah. When um, we were watching sort of the final sequences that were showing where everybody was headed, and um, Arya gets on a boat with her small smallpox blankets, and Sansa is crowned, that I whispered to Alana, "Okay, this is the montage of fan fiction prompts <laughs> because it's setting us up to be like, okay, and here's what we've got when this like." really poor poor idea for a government you know goes all henry the sixth um these are all of our options but it doesn't really give us much to go on more than we kind of want these characters to solve the problems that the finale has not managed to solve Exactly. I also remember hearing something along the internet where George R. R. Martin said that, like, the final battle with the Night King and all of that will explain a lot of why the seasons are out of whack on the planet. And that, like, the conclusion of the story will also conclude that whole thing of, like, you'll understand why dragons were born in the first place and, you know, all of this, like, seasonal balance will be restored. And the show didn't touch on any of that. Uh, which I always thought was like a super critical and important cultural thing that made Planetos so distinct, right? Because winter doesn't just happen in Westeros. It's a planetary thing. Yeah. Like, it should be happening in Essos as well. And there are also theories that, like, north of the wall, that landmass connects to Essos. I remember reading something about that that was, like, super interesting because, like, other people beyond the Bone Mountains have similar stories of White Walkers that they did um, in Westeros. So, like... And that just felt like a huge missed opportunity, too. Of course, they were rushed and everything. Um, so, yeah, I don't know yeah, why I Yeah, I mean, expecting. it just... It, I, we really fucking loved the world building. Like, that is what got us so excited about it. So that, for me, one of the things that I really missed is, you know, the, 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 the show really lost track of the prophecies. The show... Yes. Um, like, who, who, so wait, so who, who is Azor Ahai? Is, was Azor Ahai John because he had to kill Nissa Nissa, but Lightbringer was the dragon, and I guess he rode in its back? Or maybe no, you just don't care about the prophecies at all. I'll tell you which prophecy did not end up coming to place, even though they referenced it in a flashback, which was the uh, Cersei's death prophecy. You yeah. know, three gold veils shall they wear, and when it's all over, the Valonqar will strangle you. With it, you know, I was like, I was like, okay, this is obviously going to be Jamie who strangles her because he's the little, he's the younger sibling, and we don't have any of that in here. I, I feel like it's lesser for not having sort of these really beautifully interesting written prophecies addressed. Mm -hmm. The one thing that was touched on though is in Danny's vision from the House of the Undying. Was it yeah, which snow? They changed, yeah. Was it snow or was it nuclear ash? Well, there was nuclear ash raining down in the throne room. I mean, yeah, so what, what, what? are there any pieces of prophecies that we actually did get after all, Stephen? So um, I, I, I did want to correct you on, on one thing, ah. uh, just because I made this same mistake. So the version of the Valonqar prophecy from the show omits the line about the Valonqar. It's only about her kids. Oh. Um, which, like... Okay, so they didn't know, forget, they just made a different choice. Yeah, you know, uh, and it seems like it... They mainly excise stuff. I'm trying to remember if the lines like the prince who was promised ever came up in the show. Uh, hold on. I think it has. I think it has because they talked about how that could have been a prince or a princess, right? Yeah, yeah. No, no, that was in the show. Sorry, I've, I'm, I've gone to the Game of Thrones wiki because they usually have like episode references. So you the are prince very who was promised, uh, Melisandre talks about that. Um, but, like, yeah, that that's a weird... Like, apparently John was brought back from the dead because he had to kill Daenerys? Question mark? Um, you know... Frankly, our little face changer could have killed Daenerys. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that's kind of, like, one of the weird things that they... Or, or one of the weird outgrowths of, like, having Arya kill the Night's King and... You know, Bran. You know, arguably manipulating the events of the last three episodes into making him king on a mountain of corpses. Like it, some of the the warp and weft of the show is getting, you know, got real twisted. Yeah. 
Okay, now I want thy headcanon to be that it was actually our little face shifter who killed Daenerys. She was the reason. The reason John did something that made sense for once is because John was actually <laughs> Arya. Yes, okay. I love it. We're, we're done. It. We're done here. We've solved the episode. Yes. Whew. John did something that made sense because it was Arya. Thank you. Actually, in that scene, um, well, one, that whole entire scene was shot so fucking be- beautifully, holy fuck. Uh, but two... The, 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 the most emotion I felt in the whole finale was Drogon. I'm sure I'm not the only person who says this. They, the, the, the CGI direction of the dog, I'm sorry, not the dog, the, the dragon, dragon, finding its dead human mm-hmm. and moving the body with its nose. I believe Stefan Sasa pointed out that's what Bambi does in the movie. I could never watch Bambi, so I trust him on this matter. Doesn't it also uh, The Lion King? I could never watch the Lion King. Yeah. Okay, so I, I think we're finding a, a common vein here. Uh, um, Disney dead parent stuff. Yeah, I don't. I, the only Disney I watch is was Robin Hood. Sorry. Anyway, <laughs> all the rest of them just did not have as much ro- ro- stealing from the rich. That's um, a good point, Robin. It, is the Robin Hood the only animated Disney film without a dead parent? Moana. You know, Drogon's acting. Drogon picking up, burning down a throne, which won, like, was the kind of thing where Super people satisfying. saw it coming because it was correct. Like, mm-hmm. and yeah. yes, when people's vision of something is correct, then you have to do it. Don't be like, oh, it was a twist. Um, so, the you know, the powerful of the dragon burning down the Iron Throne because this thing is too dangerous to stand, grabbing his mom and flying off to never be seen again. I was like, okay, this little piece, this little piece right here is perfect. This little encapsulation Has here. truth to it. There's real, exactly, real emotion. And I felt so bad for Drogon. I really hope him when he flies over to the ruins of Valyria, he finds some other dragons there and they can make dragon babies and eat some sheep and stuff. <laughs> um, or maybe he goes to a shy. That was like one of my thoughts too. It was like, where's Drogon going to take Daenerys? Um, because not having read all of the books, but like always reading up about them, I know that like, People have kept telling Daenerys to go to Ashai, and she keeps choosing not to. So in my head, watching them fly off, I was like, that's where Drogon's taking her, and that seems really fitting. And maybe, so are they gonna, I don't like, know. resuscitate her somewhere over in S- Asai or something? <clears throat> like Maybe they resuscitate her. Maybe something magic happens with her body as it's cremated and forms a dragon egg or, like, some, I don't know. Oh, shit, dude. I want that to happen. I know. Damn. Like, she's a terrible tyrant, and I'm glad he killed her, but, like, there's an essence there that could be reborn into a pure, I don't know. Dragoner form. Say yeah. yeah. Into Kid uh, Apocalypse. A pure dragoner form. Yes, yeah, she could become Kid Apocalypse, or a dragon form. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, that's really beautiful. Uh, but, yeah, that shot was gorgeous. I mean, shit, the one with the shot with the uh, the, the wings coming out of her back was also yes. sort of like a watch that. I'm like, everybody's going to, it was gorgeous. But I'm sorry. Give me the budget. I could fucking shoot that. That's obvious. That's obvious. How do you not have that happen? But it's beautiful mm-hmm. staging, beautifully executed. Oh, did you did you know that Danny was the dragon? No, I, I knew that. But yeah, it's fucking beautiful. I can't I can't be too sarcastic about something that was as beautiful as that was. It, it kind of reminded and all, me. And just the, the the watching the Iron Throne meld. I was not expecting that to be a casualty, and I really enjoyed it. Oh, cool. Well, it yeah, was, was so great. satisfying. Oh, yeah. Um, it made me think of this, like, I think it's Flannery O'Connor who has this quote about endings is that they have to feel, um, at both at once surprising and inevitable. And I feel like burning the throne down was like really for me, the only part of the, this conclusion of the show that was both surprising and inevitable. That's beautiful. Uh, Steven, I have a book reader question for you. Sure. So in the show, it's been clear to me for a long time that Varys is legitimately someone who's trying to do the best he can. And he was wrong to support the uh, the established monarchy in the ways he did. But he, he was coming from a place of thinking that was the best way to, to keep things going there. But in the book... Whoa. No. No? Well, I was going to say, in the books, no, 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 no. Yeah, exactly. See, but in the books... You know, there's this, like, Varys has the same sort of monologue where he's like, I'm really truly the people's, like, I'm the guy who actually cares about what happens to the small folk. I'm, I am deep state. I'm the stability of the realm. And I, do you believe Varys' line about how, about, do you believe Varys' line is true in the book? I mean, I, I don't know if you think he did the right thing in the show, but yeah. Um, you can talk about Varys. 
Sure. <laughs> I mean, I would say that, you know, in, in the books, like, Varys is the arch-utilitarian. Like, the irony is that Book Varys would never turn against Daenerys for this reason. Like, he is all about, like, building a utopia on a mountain of skulls and crossing, a you know, an ocean of blood to do that. Like, this is a guy, his, his, his uh, standard operating procedure is to mutilate children, to rip out their tongues so they can be better, you know, uh, spies. espionage. Yeah, espionage agents. That would, spies. Is, why didn't I? Anyway, um, <laughs> you know, and his his whole thing is that, like, he's been working this incredible long con on the Westerosi monarchy because he really believes in his heart of hearts that, you know, if you put the perfect prince on the throne. You know, you train them right, you eliminate all the obstacles to basically an enlightened despot, they can build a utopia. And he is willing to, you know, conduct wars, he is willing to assassinate people, he's willing to destabilize the country, all of that misery, as long, you know, for him, as long as it brings about, you know, uh, a, a new world order is fine. So in in you know a lot of ways the like the Varus of of season eight is completely unrecognizable to the the Varus of the books. It it makes me also think about like the, what the way this all sort of reflects back on, uh, I would say the upper classes' views of democracy. Um, there, the if folks aren't if folks haven't if, I recommend anybody to just check out the podcast uh, Citadel Dropouts. From, with from um, Spencer Ackerman and Laura Hudson, uh, they did a really good dive into sort of this the series ending, particularly as a reflection of people who believe in a sort of status quo, uh, white dude, de- um, moderate democracy. Like, I mean, but, but, I'll, but I'll tell you, it broke my heart. Fucking George R. R. Martin himself said something nice about Joe Biden on the internet recently. So Oof. maybe Yeah, well maybe you know, even he, maybe even the man himself is also blind. He is of a certain generation. Yeah. The the Joe Biden memes though of Edmund Tully, like Uncle Joe, please sit are amazing. Uh, they really are. I live for them. <laughs> they I really do live for them. Um I, I uh I in New York people were saying like that they needed one with um de Blasio but I think the Biden is actually more apt yeah it's also interesting because like you know in the books Edmure Tully did something really wonderful which we never see in the show so it was hard for me to sort of pivot into to sort of laugh at him in, in the show in that moment which we needed but like in the books Edmure Tully is the one lord who when his people are under siege he's like if you if I turn myself over to you you'll like let people fucking eat and they say yes and so he does it he like gives himself up so his people can eat. Like nobody else has done something as like big mm-hmm. as that, basically. And so I'm like, but I like Admir. He's the guy who like put his own needs below that of his citizens that one time, the only person ever. <laughs> um, and uh, but in the show that never happens. So it's just this like this. Yeah, like, the, I mean this this comes to the the problem of like character complexity, which is Edmure in the books is a, a fuck up, but he's a fuck up who like has a good heart. Like, he is the person who lets the small folk into a castle under siege, even if that means they're going to run out of food, because his people were afraid. Like, that is a, a, a morally good thing to do. In the show, he has always just been, you know, the one-note fuck-up. Yeah. You do lose that, nu- that nuance. Um, so, uh, listener question that we got was, was there any premonition or indication that things would go to Bran in the end? Um, Steven, did you, did uh, you see any of that? I mean, I, in, in so, either the text or the, or the show. Okay. I mean, not so much in the show. Um, in the text, I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe if they're doing this whole Fisher King, you know, the, the wounded king, the king is the land, the land is the king kind of thing. Um maybe I could see that, but, like, it hasn't, there hasn't really been that much, uh, set up, even in the books, for that. Uh, and, like, I, this is something I, I wrote about and I've talked about, like, if, if anything, you know, his story, I, I could buy him becoming, like, a spiritual authority way more than, a uh, political authority, because, you know, he is the three-eyed crow, he is the green seer. 
you know, he, he sees the past and the future. That is a powerful role. You don't have to have a crown to be powerful. And and he's sort of the security state. <laughs> I hate to throw that in, but it's like you're sort of torn because, like, on the one hand, like, he's someone who... Yes, well, he, he did get t- trained by the guy who ran the previous yep. security state in Westeros. Yep. A thousand eyes and one everywhere watching you. Yep, yep. And now he has the ability to sit and see everyone. I mean, it's interesting because in the books, I kind of did think Bran was going to be prob- permanently plugged into a tree, looking at the world and sublimating messages. So I, I don't think that that's what's going to happen in the books. Do you? If they, if they, if they exist. Um, I don't think so. Like, I, you know, I, I'm of the opinion. You know, there's been a lot of of debate by book fans about like how much did Martin tell them. How much is this like the books? But for even from the way that the showrunners have talked about it, um, you know, they've mentioned, like, for example, these, like, three holy shit moments. That suggests a very narrow bullet point of just, you know, I would argue, Danny, John, Tyrion. Um, and that makes sense because we know that Martin is a gardener, not an architect. As a writer, I don't think he had a fully fleshed idea of where all of the characters ended and how they would get there when he talked to them lo those many years ago. Um, so, you know, who knows? I guess I, I, we should wrap in just a minute. Um, but I guess there's one thing that I just keep being torn over is like with Danny, like there's this inclination to say, um, you know, anybody who is, going to be showing up in another country and making a decision that they know what should happen there is obviously going to be doing so in a mode of of tyranny. But, like, you know, we're looking at, like, again, I just always come back to the U.S.'s involvement in World War II. Like, thank you, America, for coming here, or else I would literally not exist, right? Sorry, but here I'm into Europe. Um, (laughs) You know, and you sort of challenge of, like, you know, it feels like there's just one school of thought that very much holds that, like, because Danny was um, doing any form of conquering at all, you know, when it ended up happening, when it when she ended up doing a full-on bombing of King's Landing, like, that they viewed that as being an inevitable result of, of that in the first place. And that... Um, it was wrong to sort of believe any of the liberatory language at all and then the other school of thought thinking that um there was a way for her to have you know not fucking equi- not, to not draw an equivalent between like killing people who own slaves and killing you know people in a feudalistic society who are not actually slave owners uh and also mostly killing their fucking victims um you know it, it's like this it, I, I think it's a sort of thing where both of these approaches feel sort of incomplete to me. And yeah. I guess, yeah. Yeah. I How also think answer? like Sorry. the like, really insulting one is like this Targaryen genetic lineage of destruction to me always it, like has felt kind of offensive, like from day one of yeah. like, Oh, she's oh. just turning into her dad or like, yeah. these are how all Targaryens are. And like the show, when they would do the like previously on game of Thrones, and they really sort of dug that in. Like she's a Targaryen. That's where this violence comes from. And I'm like, no, I think that's BS. I, I think it's, I'm fine with having a very nuanced idea of is Daenerys a liberator or not because she, you know, even though she has this like noble pedigree, she was pretty much in captivity being raised by her brother, right? And she had to like come out from under there. So she has a lived experience of being powerless and then has come into power and was trying to do the best that she can do. Um, And I, I still stand by like, most of burning down King's Landing was really just pain, was like her own emotional pain at like, this is the end and this is how this is going to go. Like, I'm not going to actually face my enemy and like everything is going to pretty much be the same. Like, I didn't come here to be the status quo. Um, So I, I kind of believe it. I, I do think there's like a lot of obviously weirdness of like, the white woman who comes to liberate all the people of color and then they just become expendable characters to be killed and then repopulated because like literally we all thought all the dothraki were dead and then there was like so many of them in the last episode i was like what happened 
Um, and they all were very pale and white passing, which is also a problem. Um, <laughs> the, the white Dothraki were the, clearly the only ones to survive. It was yeah. Yeah, yeah, just the way of nature, you know. Exactly. This game was better adapted to the climate or something, I guess. I yeah, and honestly, my follow up to what I'm hearing from you, which is really valid, is like. I'm really sorry that you're having a lot of feelings, Karen, but you just can't burn down all of King's Landing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I you know, they, they everyone deserved everyone deserved better, right? Yeah. So, I think I think like one of the things that I feel like I've learned over the course of this experience watching this show is like how much I really don't want white men telling my stories are telling stories to me like that's like the number one take home is like i feel like more of us who are on the margins queer people people of color women you know people of different body sizes and abilities like we need to take ownership of storytelling and our characters and our stories because left to the devices of like rich hollywood hbo showrunners they're going to fuck it up they don't know how to tell the complexity um and but we do, and we should get more of a shot to do that. So tell folks where they can find your book. Yes. <laughs> so you can find my speculative fiction short story collection. It's called Dark Corners. Um, it's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble, anywhere you buy books online or in person. So if you want to go to your favorite local independent bookstore um, and order it, Dark Corners by Ruben Teehee Hazlett, and it'll be there in a few days, and you can support your local bookstore. Or you can go on I've Amazon it. and get it. Yeah, I read it. I really enjoyed it. It was super smart. Every story in it felt really fresh to me, really inventive. It was not stuff I'd ever seen before. Um, so if if you're someone who is interested in like really creative speculative fiction and imagery and modern storytelling, like definitely check out Ruben's book for real. And Stephen, where can we find all of your various published thoughts on this show for which you've given uh, so much so- of your time and effort? And it's like amazing how much you've given yes. us. So, uh, I write about uh, A Song of Ice and Fire at raceforthearonthrone.wordpress.com. Uh, you can also find me at Tumblr at raceforthearonthrone. Um, I just launched a Patreon, which is patreon.com slash Stephen Atwell, uh, one word. And uh, I am trying to basically move towards uh, writing about the intersection of history, politics, and pop culture. Uh, more full time so if you can spare a few bucks a month uh, please do contribute and like seriously folks you've been reading Stephen's work for no money at all about A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones for forever now like we've all gotten so much out of it there are so many basic principles that fandom now understands uh, about the way the system of game of, about the way the world of Planetos works that we learned and gained from reading Stephen so, so support his work it's really important and Sarah, where can we find you on the internet? Well, I do not have a book right now, sadly, although there might be something forthcoming about family engagement and early childhood education, which I'm sure will not be nearly as exciting. Um, but I do have a blog about the, mostly about the sport of figure skating. Sometimes I write about other things. It is at thefinersports.com. I finally saw I, Tanya, so if, <laughs> if that is your only connection to it um, and you really want to read some, some like, flaming rage, um, stay tuned. Uh, and I am at Padasha, which is P-A-S underscore D-E-C-H-A-T on Twitter. And I am E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn on Twitter, all, all too much. Uh, and thank you for joining Graphic Policy Radio. We are going to be right back with more comics coverage. And uh, if you didn't, if you're looking for an interesting new uh, global uh, space saga that's from a different perspective than this TV show, for sure, uh, the episode I just that is on right before this one, the previous one with Ben Khan uh, about their story, um, their, their their new comic, which has just come out. Griffin, The Galaxy's Most Wanted, Anarchy in the Milky Way, and their earlier series, Heavenly Blues. Those are definitely stories in comic form that you have not seen elsewhere from a different voice. So so check those out as well. Awesome. Uh, thanks for listening and keep it geeky. Hey 
Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.